This morning, I want to talk about joy. I usually give a message on joy every other year or so, but I usually do it in the summer. I actually usually, in June, when people are going on vacations or coming home from vacations, I'll give a message on joy. But I recently received an email from someone that told me that for 2021, they were choosing joy as the theme for this new year for them. And I thought, wow, what a great idea. And this particular person that told me this, that they're choosing joy for 2021, they suffered more loss than probably the rest of us did. They had a rough year. They had some people in their family pass away. And so I began to wonder what it would look like for all of us to choose joy for 2021 in the middle of a global pandemic. So this message will be a little bit different than the normal message that I give in, on joy in the summer months. But before we get into the message on joy, I really feel like we need to take a little bit of a very important detour, and we need to, take about, we need to talk about mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, mourning is in what we do after we suffer loss. It occurs to me that we have many things from 2020 that we need to mourn, because if we don't, that could actually interfere with our joy for 2021. I want to start by reading a quote to you. I want to read a quote about this idea of mourning that I found very helpful. It's, from a, it's, it's a beautiful little book, although a bit peculiar. The book is called A Pastor's Alphabet. Uh, it's written by a fellow vineyard pastor. Really, it's just his journal entries. It's his personal journal, journal entries. Uh, the author's name is Jeff Miller, A Pastor's Alphabet. But he writes on mourning. It was a typical Sunday at church. Morning worship, the sound of voices lifted in unison, a transcendence as the presence of God inhabited our singing, the warmth of the candles, the liturgy, the people of God assembling again to celebrate Jesus. I made my way to the communion table as we offer this sacrament every Sunday during worship time. Stepping up to receive the body and blood of Jesus, what seemed like an incongruity stopped me in my tracks. A woman in her early 20s stood a few feet from the table, propped up by the wall, sobbing. Her pain was obvious, difficult to watch, and known to many of us. She had just lost a child to miscarriage. These two things merged at once in my mind. The incredible miracle of forgiveness that is the linchpin of our faith in the mourning and agony without which it would not be possible. All of the ways we strive to be like Jesus, perhaps we least identify with his mourning. But there is something necessary in mourning, and in sharing Jesus' sufferings, we become stronger people. In Mark's gospel account, Jesus bears his soul to his disciples. As he prepares to bear the cross, I am deeply grieved to the point of death, Jesus says. Have you ever felt this way? Maybe you have, but to admit it might make you feel ashamed. But I think we can find tremendous comfort in Jesus' words here. His statement is not a permission for us to drown in narcissistic self-pity and victimization as we are inclined to do. Rather, it communicates to all who follow Jesus that sometimes we will carry a bitterness of soul that would destroy us. And perhaps there is something positive in that experience. But we, especially in the first world, have lost the art of mourning. Robert Bly notes... How can we look at the cinder side of things when the society is determined to create a world of shopping malls and entertainment complexes in which we are made to believe there is no death, disfigurement, illness, insanity, poverty, or misery? Our Disneyland culture has insulated us from the proper mourning experience, and the church has participated in this ruse. The idea that we need to put on our best to be in, in front of God and other people seems to me to contradict Jesus' description of himself as a hospital for the damaged rather than a dog and pony show for the perfect. Maybe instead of our best shirt and makeup, we should wear grief and sorrow to church. And every church that is a place for the broken should have boxes of tissues scattered liberally throughout the facility. We've got those here, don't we? Sorrow for sorrow's sake is not fruitful. But there is a healthy and necessary way to grieve. It is part of the process that heals us from tragedy. To grieve means that we are swallowing the bitter pill that life has given us in this season. 
It means that we accept our cross, our circumstances, and incorporate it into life rather than refuse it. To deny this experience is to declare that we are immune to pain and that we are in control and unwilling to accept anything that unhinges us. That we are properly composed and need not let anyone know that we are really broken. You can do this for hours or maybe years, but it will turn you but it will turn you into a hard and bitter person, and you will become unable to experience any sympathy or compassion for others because your heart is covered by a crust of self-reliance. By taking the hard road of ashes is a good thing. Jesus did it, and because of this, he understands our mourning. He is not scared nor offended by our pain, and in turn, we can walk into the suffering of others, offering comfort. Ten years later, the young lady at the beginning of this story is still a part of our church. She was embraced by many who bore her burdens and let her be weak. Through this, she experienced the love of the church and the love of Jesus himself. Would that we would give ourselves and those around us the permission to be like Jesus in this. Loosen up your collar, bear your soul, stop pretending, and you will find healing and be able to offer it to others. It makes for a healthy church and a healthy heart. So without proper mourning, it might be difficult for us to experience true joy. Without mourning, our hearts can become too hard. Remember the promise that Jesus gives, you, gives us in Matthew 5, 4, where he says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. There is both blessing and comfort in mourning. Many of us suffered a lot of loss last year in 2020, and many of that loss, much of that loss might need to be mourned in order for our hearts to remain soft enough to receive the joy of 2021. Some of us last year suffered much greater loss than others. I know some people did lose loved ones last year. For others, the losses might be more subtle, but they still need mourning. Unmet expectations, disappointments, Loss of jobs, loss of income. For me, it was loss of health, not related to COVID. Even for many of us, there was just a loss of normalcy. Our lives were completely turned upside down, and we didn't have the normal things that we did in life. We didn't have friendships. We weren't able to get together and just hang out with friends like we would have normally done. That's still a loss that we suffered that can be mourned. And so I think that as we look to close out 2020 and enter into 2021 with joy, maybe we need to start by making a list of the things that we need to mourn. What are some of the losses that we experienced last year? Make a list of those things and then begin to mourn them properly so that there's place in our heart for joy. Then as we make that list, I think there's a couple other things. So we need to make a list of what do we need to mourn, even the smaller things, even the subtle things, what are the things that we need to mourn? And then secondly, who can we mourn with? Biblical mourning is always done in community. And even in that story that I just read, that woman who had a miscarriage, she was able to mourn with her collective church community. So who can you mourn with? And then finally, what story does your mourning have to tell about your life and about God? So as you look at the things that you might need to mourn, there's a story hidden in that either about yourself or about God. And that story might be important. It might be important too as we look to choose joy for 2021. And now as pointed out in that quote that I read, by mourn, I don't mean to wallow in self-pity or feeling sorry for yourself. Mourning means bringing your losses and disappointments to Jesus and letting him carry them. After all, he is fully aware of sorrow and loss and can carry all of our burdens, amen? Now, let's move on to talking about joy. I want to start with reading to you a quote from uh, Pastor Bill Johnson. I love this quote. I've had it in my notebook for years. He says, we want to be strong without joy, but your strength is measured by your measure of joy. You are no stronger than your joy. I love that. He makes the claim, and I believe it's true, we are no stronger than our joy. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about joy. I kind of made a, a list one time of, 
all the scriptures that refer to joy or even just kind of hint at the idea of joy. So there's a lot in the scriptures that we could choose from. But for today, I just want to focus on John 15 for the sake of time. Plus, I think this John 15 passage is a bit of a how-to. It really kind of explains us how we can enter into joy. So John 15, starting in verse 9. And I'm sorry, I don't have it up on the screen here for you today. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy might be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no end than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Now the context here, picking up in John 15, 9, where we did, the context is this comes right after Jesus' teaching of the vine. We are all branches on a vine and we must stay connected to the vine to remain alive. Then Jesus transitions to talking about love and joy. We have to keep in mind this idea of remaining connected to the vine as we look at joy because he's building on that same principle still. Verse 9, he says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, now remain in my love. Jesus says that because the Father has loved him, he is able to love his disciples. The Greek grammar here suggests things like perfection and completeness in the love the Father has for Jesus and therefore us. Jesus ends this verse by saying, remain in his love, just like a branch must remain in the vine. The grammar here suggests that even despite the completeness and perfection of God's love, it still requires our participation. We remain in the Father's love by remaining in the love of Jesus, just like the branch in the vine. But again, this is an active thing on our part, just like with any human relationship, we have to work on that. We have to press into that a little bit. So now, of course, we may be left to wonder just exactly how do we stay in his love? Verse 10, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. Wow, look at that. Jesus answered our question. Just as I have obeyed my father's commands and remain in his love. Isn't it interesting that the key to remaining in Jesus' love is to obey his commands? He could have said a lot of different things, couldn't he, about how to remain in his love? But he says the best way, the most important way to remain in his love is to obey his commands. Then the next verse goes on to tell us that this is also the key to joy. Remaining in the love of God and finding joy is rooted in obeying Jesus' commands. So, of course, now we have to ask, well, what are Jesus' commands? He gives us one here in this passage that we'll look at in just a minute. But I also want to jump really quickly to Matthew 22 and read uh, some of his commands there. So Matthew 22, verse 36, Jesus was answering a question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So here in the Matthew passage, Jesus says that the second most important commandment is to love others as ourselves, which by implication then ties back to joy from the John 15 passage we're looking at. Loving others as ourselves is a key then to finding joy. Now back to John 15, let's look at verse 11. John 15, 11, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Jesus now makes this connection very clear. We obey his commands so that his joy may be in us and that our joy may be complete. Notice that it says that it's his joy that's going to be in us. This isn't some random joy. This is Jesus' joy. This isn't joy that we manufacture on our own or get through circumstances. And I, want to, I really want to emphasize that. As I talk about joy, I don't want people thinking that they got to go out and like try to like muster up some joy. This is the joy of Christ. This is the joy of Christ that he's going to give us. And if it's his joy, then it's perfect joy. Our, our circumstances also won't bring about joy. People all the time say, well, once I get this or once I do that or once I have this, then I'll be 
joyful or happy. It doesn't work that way. Circumstances do not bring about joy. The joy promised in this scripture is the joy that comes straight from Jesus himself. So we don't have to work at this. Joy is not based on what you have. Joy is based on who you know, Jesus. Conversely, when we lack joy, we cannot blame our circumstances or our lack. If we lack joy, we must look at how connected we are to Jesus. If we lack joy, we are too self-focused. If we lack joy, we are too self-focused and our eyes are not on Jesus. Now, it also says here in verse 11 that his joy will be in us. This is the only way that we would want joy, right? Deep inside of us, not something external or superficial. Then it says that our joy may be complete. The Greek word here means full measure. He wants us to have a full measure of joy. What he's actually talking about is the total amount of joy possible. Do you see this? What Jesus is giving us is not a little, like, not just like a little smidgen of joy. He's giving us the full amount of joy that is actually possible. And it's a promise to us that that's what he'll give us. Who wants that in their life? I can see most of you. Who wants the fullness, the, the, the greatest amount of joy possible in their life? Well, I saw two people raise their hand. We got a couple people. We got hope for a few people. When we remain in his love and obey his commands, Jesus puts the full measure of his joy deep inside of us. Does this mean I'm always happy and everything is coming up roses? No, of course not. Happiness is fleeting. Happiness is based on circumstances. Joy is eternal. Joy is rooted in the nature of who God is. So even in the midst of a global pandemic, we can be filled with the full measure of his joy. As we remain in his love. John 15, 12. He says, my command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. That's very similar to what we just looked at in Matthew 22, isn't it? But now Jesus says, remain in my love. And the key to remaining in my love is to obey my commands. Here in verse 12, he gives us a command. My command is this. It couldn't be any more clear, could it? Like Jesus really lays it out. This is what you do. Remain in my love, follow my commands. The command is this, love each other as I have loved you. So first he tells us to remain in his love. Then he tells us to obey his commands as a means to stay in his love. Then he gives us a promise of per perfect joy, the full measure of joy possible. But then he gives us this one last command. In Matthew 22, there was two commands, love God and love others. Here in this context, we only see one, love each other. And the standard for that love, he says, is the way that I have loved you, which was to give his life on a cross. So do you see that he's saying, remain in my love and follow my commands, love the way I did, but the way he did it was on a cross. So he's not inviting us into something superficial or light or easy. But let me ask you this. Do you find this to be true, that when you love on someone, no strings attached, you find joy in that? The Lord responds to our obedience to love others. The Lord moves into the action of loving others with our joy, with, with his joy. So when we go and we act, when we have a deliberate act of loving on somebody else, Jesus moves into that action with his love and his joy. He loves on us with no strings attached and then look at his perfect joy. So he's inviting us to love others, no strings attached, so that he may put that fullness of joy back into us. This is also where we can practice our spiritual gifts, loving on people through our spiritual gifts. For our joy to be complete, we need to be connected to Jesus in the vine, but also to each other. We're interconnected in this. Think about the branches of a vine. They can't separate themselves from each other. Branches on a vine can't social distance. In a vine, all the branches are they're all touching and they're all mingled together. We are interconnected in this because we all bear the image of God, right? So if I fail to love someone else well, I actually fail to love the God image that's in me. 
And if I disrespect someone else, I disrespect the God image that's in me. Verse 13, greater love has no end than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Jesus goes on to say that this love can be sacrificial. Now, he is, of course, referring to his own sacrifice on the cross, but he is also, again, inviting us into this kind of sacrificial love for the sake of fullness of joy. In sacrificial love, we find joy, but that's not the message of our world, is it? Now, I want to briefly run through a few things that can attack our joy. Number one, church culture. In the church a few generations ago, there was a rise of what are called Stoics. Those who thought that the best practice of the Christian life was to lead a very Stoic life, a very somber life. Today in the church, tears are generally more accepted than joy or laughter. If we see someone in church crying, we think, oh good, God is working. But if we see someone laughing, we think, what's the matter with them? Bill Johnson says this, People seem to be good with the idea of joy as a theological value, but they disdain it as an actual experience, especially as a corporate expression. It appears to be out of order, and it is, but whose order does joy violate? Now, of course, another reason, another thing that can steal our joy is the enemy. Satan loves to attack our joy because it is a gift from God. Think about it. Jesus promised us the full measure of joy. So if God gives us the full measure of joy, then Satan puts a bullseye in it and says, I'm going to attack that because that is precious and it's from God. So Satan loves to attack our joy. John Piper in his book, Desiring God, says Satan's number one objective is to destroy our faith and joy. If Satan can steal our joy and get us into a place of discouragement or despair, he can then begin to turn us from faith in God. So if Satan attacks our joy, it ultimately becomes an attack on our faith as well. Here's another one that I think believe, that I believe uh, attacks our joy. Entitlement thinking. We live in a culture and a world with entitlement thinking everywhere. We are bombarded with messages from both advertisers and the government that say we are entitled to a plethora of things. We deserve this, we deserve that. Notice how many TV commercials start with, you deserve, you deserve. But the problem with buying into this thinking is that it steals our joy. It sets us up for unmet expectations and disappointment, and it leaves us wanting more, never satisfied. And if you're always wanting more, there's no joy. Most importantly, entitlement thinking removes any sense of thanksgiving and acknowledgement of God. If I deserve this, then I tend not to be thankful for it. But all of this works against our joy. And then the fourth thing that I see that steals our joy, especially in 2020, was worry and fear. This past year was filled with lots of opportunity for worry over health, it was filled with opportunity for fear, again, over health and perhaps politics. I watched so many people this last year become so filled with worry and fear, and then, of course, in doing that, they lost their joy. I also watched society as a whole begin treating each other terribly because of this worry and fear. Both my wife and I experienced just awful experiences out in public in stores People so paralyzed by fear and worry that they would just treat you in the most nasty way. Our behavior as a society, as a society this past year was far from what Jesus commands us to do in loving each other. And so we have lost our joy. And then number five, a fifth way that I see that our joy can be stolen is personal sin. Unrepentant personal sin can steal our joy. After all, in Psalm 51, David cries out, restore the joy of my salvation. So after he sinned, he realizes that his joy is gone, and so he cries out to God, restore the joy of my salvation. So if sin is the joy stealer for you, repent and then read aloud Psalm 51 as a prayer. And finally, we don't get to blame our circumstances or lack 
for our loss of joy. There might be a temptation, but we can't. We can't blame our job for our loss of joy. We can't blame our other responsibilities for our loss of joy. We don't get to blame COVID. We don't get to blame meeting, not meeting in person for church. We don't get to take any of those circumstances and say, that's what made me lose our joy. Remember, Jesus gives us complete joy. The full amount of joy possible is what Jesus has given us. It's his promise. It's his guarantee. Our circumstances can't steal it. The only way we lose our joy is if we hand it over. Do you see that? There are some things that can peck away at our joy, but we have to give in to that. We have to cooperate with those things to lose our joy because the joy that Jesus has given us is the full measure, the full possibility of joy. So now what might be God doing in our day? Remember that Jesus said our joy would be complete if we obeyed his commands. And his second most important command is to love others as ourselves. So as the church, the global church, not just our church, the global church, have we lost our fullness of joy because we have not loved others well? In the midst of this pandemic, are we seeing some things exposed? Have we as the global church done a good job loving others as ourselves? Is the general lack of complete joy in much of the church tied to failing to live out this command? I mean, the command in John 15 here is just so clear and so basic and laid out. I think about how much joy my wife Amy and I have when we return from a missions trip. But we've been halfway around the world to go and love others unconditionally. And we return with such joy. I think about how much joy we have after doing an outreach. I remember earlier in 2020 on Palm Sunday, we handed out palm branches throughout, throughout this area. And I just remember how much joy we had after doing that outreach. I think about how much joy we have when we serve at the food pantry or we're ministering to somebody or doing a deliverance. How much joy that brings to us as we serve others with unconditional love. So as we wrap up 2020, has God been moving our blind spots to how we have failed to love others. And so now I'm wondering, as we enter 2020, is God inviting us to greater levels of joy in 2021 through greater obedience to his command to love others as ourselves? And as Christians, we really got to get this right. It's so clear as part of his command. Are we as Christians losing our witness? Not just our joy, but we're losing our witness because we haven't loved others well. I stumbled upon this organization recently, and quite some time ago in a previous message, I read a story from them. But there's this organization called Preemptive Love. It was started by a couple from the United States, and they travel around the world, and they go to the really, really hard places of the world just to show unconditional love. They go to Syria. They go to Iran. They go to Iraq. But here in the United States, we tend to think of Syrians and Iranians and Iraqis as our enemy or at least our government has painted them as our enemies. But this organization goes into those places, and they even go to the people who are acting in terrorist ways, and they show unconditional love to them. I watched a whole bunch of the videos of some of the things they've done, and it's just amazing work that they're doing, <clears throat> loving people unconditionally. But here's the thing. They're not Christians. They make a very emphatic statement that we are not religious. We don't do this in the name of any God. We're just doing this for the sake of humanity, to love others well. They're showing Christians up by going to the people that have been deemed as our enemies, and they're loving them unconditionally, and they're not even believers. We need to love others well as a way to get back into joy. And right now, I think the conditions of our society are so ripe. 2020 has worn us down. It's made us weary. It's made us fearful and sick and all that other stuff that I mentioned. There is a lost and dying world out there that is looking for the followers of Jesus to come love them well. And in exchange, we, the followers of Jesus, get the full measure of Jesus' love. Now, let me make a point about us as individuals here. In order to love others well, I, of course, have to love myself, right? If I don't love myself, it's going to be really hard for me to love others. 
So how am I doing at both loving myself and then loving others around me? I think a good test of this is what's coming out of your mouth or your keyboard. What do you remember? Jesus says, for out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. What are you saying? What are you typing? What are you posting? That's a good indication of where the love level of your heart is. Are you loving yourself well and are you loving others well? So as we enter into 2021, can we as a church and as individuals choose joy as a theme for ourselves? And now having looked at this John 15, we know that, that the key to getting to joy is the need to love others well. So I would ask you, what are some practical ways that you can begin to love others around you, your neighbors, your friends? What are some things that you can start to do, even when you're out in public at the store? Undo some of the nastiness that we've seen in public this past year. What are some ways that we can real practically begin to love others well, maybe make some cookies and take them to your neighbor or do something as a way to choose joy for 2021, okay? And remember, the Lord responds to our obedience to love others by stepping in with his joy. So as we step out and love others well, he will come and he will respond to that and he will bring his joy to us. <clears throat> James, can you get me some water? I want to start by reading uh, one last passage of scripture. I'm not going to comment on it. I just want to read this passage of scripture to you. It's 2 Corinthians 4, but I'm reading it from the Living Bible. I just love the way it renders in the Living Bible. 2 Corinthians 4 from the Living Bible. This is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our inner strength is in the Lord. Our inner strength in the Lord is growing every day. These troubles and sufferings of ours are, after all, quite small and won't last very long. Let me read that again. These troubles and sufferings of ours are, after all, quite small and won't last very long. You've got to remember that as we think about all the troubles of 2020. In the grand scheme of things, they won't last very long. James and I were talking about this before the service began. If the issues of 2020 really kind of stress you out, read the book of Ecclesiastes. It'll put everything in perspective for you. Just sit down and read the book of Ecclesiastes. And it will point out how everything is short-term and everything will come to pass. All right, continuing in this passage. These troubles and sufferings of ours are, after all, quite small and won't last very long. Yet this short time of distress will result in God's richest blessings upon us forever and ever. So we do not look at what we can see right now, the troubles all around us, but we look forward to the joys in heaven which we have not yet seen. The troubles will soon be over, but the joys to come will last forever. Again, we take our eyes off of the momentary troubles, put our eyes back on Jesus, and see the joy that he will bring forever and ever. And I want to end by just reading a few uh, little sentences here about health. In, in studying this idea of joy, I found some of the health benefits of joy. And I'll probably, I'll apologize to the nurses in our audience because I'll probably mispronounce these terms, but joy expands the endothelium, the lining of the blood vessels that regulates blood flow, adjusts coagulation, and produce chemicals in response to inflammation. After a chime of joy, endothelium can be expanded by as much as 30 to 50% suggesting that regular laughter and joy could defend against hardening arteries. Joy produces nitric oxide in our body, which helps provide a good flow of blood. So joy might be more effective than your statin, who knows. Joy relaxes the whole body. A good hearty laugh, for example, relieves physical tension and stress, leaving your muscles relaxed for up to 45 minutes afterward. Joy activates endorphins. Joy and laughter trigger the release of endorphins, a rush of brain chemicals that gives us a sense of well-being. This release of endorphins has been proven to raise a person's pain threshold and can even temporarily relieve pain. Helps blood sugar. 
Some recent studies have shown that joy can even reduce blood sugar levels, increase immune function. Laughter has been shown to increase the activity of natural killer cells, our best allies against tumors and viruses. Isn't that interesting? Joy might be a good defense against COVID. Joy decreases stress hormones and increases immune cells and infection-fighting antibodies, thus improving your resistance to disease. The brain keeps growing. The part of our brain that controls joy is not only the is the only part of our brain that keeps growing. Even after a prolonged period of experiencing no joy, as soon as joy returns, that part of our brain will grow again. Isn't that interesting? So again, this all started with an email that I read from someone that said that after experiencing a lot of loss in 2020, they were choosing joy for 2021. So I want to present that to us as a congregation that for this year, Despite everything that we suffered last year, let's choose joy. Again, let's start by making a list of the things that we need to mourn. What are the losses, disappointments, unmet expectations that we need to mourn so that we don't become hard and bitter? And then let's choose joy. And the way that we choose joy is to love others well. Amen?